Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm very glad to, to be here. And uh, before I start, I think uh, our two previous speakers kind of put us in a, in a very interesting situation, and they were mentioning the, the importance of talent and global talent and mergers, acquisitions, and uh, they all got to the point that, you know, talent. And yes, uh, this is the subject today. Before I start talking about our subject, uh, I was... I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit because I am somehow uh, an in and out of this conversation. Uh, let me explain to you. Um, we are talking about multicultural talent and uh, somehow I had the privilege to be born in a family. I was born in Colombia and uh, my family decided that I would get a French education in Colombia. So they were French teachers, Lycée Francais. And then uh, I, uh, I went to the Jesuits, and I got a lot of European teachers with the Jesuits. Uh, and when I, uh, and that was, you know, high school and, uh, and college, uh, and came to the States as a student, as a foreign student, to, to do my master's, uh, finish my master's, and uh, the government of Colombia offered me to work with the international education scholarships for Colombians going abroad. Uh, worked for a year with that, and then uh, was part of a, of a project to, to come and, and do a, a PhD degree in Minnesota. And my field of uh, uh, specialty is intercultural communication, and when I was, I was a foreign student advisor at the university. So all these things, uh, uh, and say I was going to be a professor at the university, and suddenly the corporate world uh, came with said, you know, would you like to be an expatriate? Uh, and so I, expatriate, yeah, but I'm, I'm a foreign person. No, no, we'd like to be an expatriate in, in Brazil, uh, Citibank. And I accepted to go to Citibank, as, uh, to Brazil, as an expatriate. So I live as an expatriate. I was a foreign student in the States. I was an expatriate in South America for almost 10 years, live in Brazil, and then return to, to the U.S. Uh, and then I have been the last 20 years uh, working with multinational companies, Visa, uh, Bright Star, uh, and then Western Union, in working with international talent, global talent uh, assessment, uh, the culture of the company to become uh, globally. Uh, to adjust to the global needs. Um, I say that as an introduction because all these years, and now I'm a consultant uh, doing that, working in intercultural settings, uh, trying to make people understand each other, trying to get companies to understand cultures. And what we were talking this morning, trying to help companies uh, to, to, to bridge the, the, the gap uh, to understand, to respect uh, cultures and trying to help uh, executives and talent to get into that. That gives me a privileged situation of being in and out in this. And, uh, and what I'm talking today is my experience, uh, some experiences that I have learned with the companies. What I, we are going to talk about uh, our feeling about the reality of navigating in a global village and how our melting pot that we talk about here is a melting pot everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the differences uh, that we have uh, to how we face the business challenges today after this tremendous recession in this country and uh, all over the world, how are the companies looking in the future to merge, to get into where the business is? I'm going to talk a little bit about the shift in the global labor supply and the consequences for, for the companies and for the businesses. And, uh, and yes, we are going to get to some reflections on how to manage global talent in the 21st century. Uh, so let me start with some uh, comments from uh, um, 
you know, uh, Brad Sulu's, uh, uh, an author of, uh, of a book called Liquid Leadership, uh, I was reading the other day, and, and I thought it was very interesting saying that the global village of Marshall McLuhan has become a reality. The globe uh, has been contracted into a village by internet and the instantaneous movement of information uh, from every country in the world at the same time, and this brings us you know, to, a, to a social, economic, and cultural functions together in an implosion of electric speed. Everything is virtual. Um, he says that uh, most people today are in touch with more information in one week over the internet and in our work day world than our grandparents process in their entire lifetime. Um, however, in this uh, situation, there are so many differences, and we, can, we are witnesses of a lot of wars and differences within and within and between the countries, wars, uh, and uh, it, it could seem that somehow the presence of foreigners or uh, international people next to us are sti is still something uncomfortable and that we cannot adjust. We just to open the, the news and, and see all the anti-immigrants or pro-immigrants uh, uh, regulations everywhere in the world. And uh, at the same time that we live in this global village, uh, businesses are needing to expand, uh, adapt, uh, respect others. And we live like in this contradiction of uh, being together and uh, needing to expand and accept each other. Uh, I give you some data about the, the migration and how it keeps growing. I, I just decided to look at some, some of these data and we are uh, physically seeing the third wave of globalization. First it was the goods, then the money, and, and of course the people. And I have a graph that I found in the, some uh, United Nations uh, Population Division that shows uh, the places in green uh, where immigrants go, and this is by millions of, of immigrants, and the places in orange where people come from, where people live to. Uh, and, uh, and you can see this has been for, you know, Western Europe, the United States, some of these countries of the Middle East these days, China today. Uh, however, this uh, third wave of globalization has incredible numbers. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, the number of global migrants has been from 134 to 214 million, according to the World Bank. Uh, there has been a growth in the last 20 years uh, globally at 37 uh, percent, only 41 percent in the European Union, and uh, imagine North America, 80 percent uh, of growth. The last 10 years, uh, according to the U.S. Census, uh, the growth of Hispanics and Asians in the U.S. population is 43 percent growth. Uh, the two largest minorities or uh, non-American groups growing in the United States. And if you get some information uh, of the same census, which was released a couple of weeks ago, the number of Hispanic and Latinos is more than 50 million today in the United States. 16% uh, of the total population, second largest ethnic group after the white uh, non-Hispanic. Uh, non this is incredibly a uh, situation that makes me think that if you think in years ahead, uh, almost one of every four uh, people, inhabitants of this country, younger than 18 years old, is a Hispanic. Uh, so we are talking about melting pot. This is a, a reality that touches us and the same way it touches many people. The business needs to expand. There are a lot of perspectives. Uh, some of the economists, one in one direction, the others in other, say about how the world is going to recover. It's slower, it's a stronger recovery. However, uh, there is an unanimous perception that uh, this recovery is going to be in the emerging economies. And you have heard the, the BRICS and the CIVETs, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And uh, the Economist uh, magazine talks about the civets, Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, the, as countries 
is that the world is looking because uh, we have larger young populations, diversified economies, uh, relative political stable, stability, we can take Egypt a little bit out, uh, decent financial systems, uh, and they, they are not victims of high inflation or uh, trade imbalances or sort of that. Th this is uh, the way the business looks, macro look at expansion. Now, while we see the business need for expansion, the markets need into expansion, we see also the gl global labor supply also moving and changing. Uh, in the last uh, 45 years, the work age population in the emerging economies, according to the World Bank, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the next 45 years, the world population is going to grow 1.7 billion, while in the developed economies is going to decrease by 9 million. So you know where the people are going to be. By 2020, uh, the shortage of talent to fill knowledge workers' position, and I insist in that, the, it will be shortage uh, by 39 million globally, and in the US, 14 million people that will be needed to fill talent knowledge positions. Knowledge positions. In the US, uh, some of the other data that is struck me really much a lot, the retirement of baby boomers uh, happening these days means that 500 biggest companies could lose 50% of the senior management in the next five years. Um, in China, uh, at the same time, 40% of the companies find absolutely difficult to fill senior level positions. The turnover rates in, in China at the managerial level has been 25% higher than the average turnover in the world. 